First of all, uh, IDS, good morning to you. <laughs> and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, you could basically, you could fire a harpoon at uh, 360 odd Tory MPs right now and not hit one that would come on GMB, so thank you. Um, can I just start by asking you this? You're an old friend of the programme. We've had some robust exchanges over the years uh, and you've always come on and defended sometimes, in my view, the indefensible, but you've done it and you, we've got into spirited debate. The government is now into day 20 of its boycott of Good Morning Britain during the most unprecedented health crisis of our lifetime. Is it right that a government can simply boycott a flagship breakfast television show because they didn't like ministers being held aggressively on occasion to account? Uh, Piers, uh, can I just start answering this question by saying, can I send my very best wishes to Kate uh, at this difficult time? Yes, Kate absolutely. Uh, because it must be terrible for her at the moment. It is, you know, also, what, you know, and it's, 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 we haven't talked about it much because Kate Garraway is going through, you know, a living hell like many people. Uh, her husband Derek has been in very serious condition yeah. now for many, many weeks, and we can all just hope and pray that he comes through it. But it's been very, very difficult for Kate and her family. We miss her, you know, here very at the much, show. Yeah. Uh, we, we obviously send her we stay in love. touch with her a lot. We we send her and the and the kids all our love, and we just wish Derek all the very best. Um, but yeah. thank you for raising that because we haven't said much because. It would be just well, hoping, we leave it uh, to Kate, don't we? Because yeah. on Thursday, during the Clap for Carers, um, Kate does a, an update on Instagram, and then on Friday, Ben gives us an yeah. update. But thank well. you, anyway, for, for saying that. Uh, can I also then say, I am actually a fan of this programme, uh, otherwise I wouldn't come on it, and I have come on quite a lot, uh, because uh, I think it's very entertaining. But, um, yeah, well, the answer to that question is the government will have to decide. I personally, um, and this is just my personal view, because I'm not in government, but uh, I think... I'd put spokesmen on everything, frankly. Um, I'd be pushing to put them on rather than to not. But that's, you know, my view and the view of, the, of my other colleagues. I mean, so, you could argue, Ian Duncan Smith, it is a dereliction of duty by a government during a public health crisis. Um, you know, whatever you, you might think of a programme, if it is a news programme broadcasting mi to millions of viewers, those millions of viewers are actually pretty important. Yeah, no, no. I'm, I'm, listen, I'm, I'm a believer in trying to communicate. Sometimes it's tough, uh, but that's what you get paid for if you're in government. But uh, also, I just genuinely believe that we need to spread messages uh, far and wide as well at the moment about all sorts of things. So um, I would use this. But look, you know, government can answer for itself in this regard. I, I don't know what the reality is or why that is. You know but the, uh, well, I, the I, irony of it is, Ian, which I find so just uh, comical, is that the director of communications at number 10 Downing Street is a guy called Lee Kane, who in his previous job worked for the Daily Mirror. And the Daily Mirror used to get Lee Kane to dress up as a giant yellow chicken and run around after conservative politicians, including David Cameron, he might have done it to you, and jump out at them at public events and harangue them for not holding themselves to account to tough questions. That was literally what he used to do. And now the mm. same Lee Kane is running the number 10s, by most yardsticks, chaotic mm. uh, communications department throughout this crisis. And he, there he is. We've got him in action there. That's Lee Kane, the current director of communications at Downing Street, uh, in his yellow chicken outfit, looking for Tory MPs to have a go at because they were shirking <laughs> television debates. Now... There's irony and there's irony, Ian Duncan Smith. Well, that's about as ironic as life gets, isn't meanwhile, it? Meanwhile, we have you here, uh, not not chicken. Can I ask you, Ian Duncan Smith? Yesterday, Michael Gove was asked whether it was safe to to send children and teachers back into the classroom, and he said it was. Now, of course, you can't guarantee. You cannot guarantee 100% safety anywhere at the moment. But do you, would you send children right now back into a classroom? How could you reassure teachers that a child isn't going to come from a home where they've been to a supermarket, where they've picked up an infection, and that might be passed on to a teacher who may not know that they're vulnerable? This is a very difficult question, but I think we have to start all this by explaining that what we are moving into, uh, one way or the other, and the whole world is going to have to do this, is to move slowly out of absolute lockdown uh, and balance the risks. So there's no absolute no risk. That's the question, and the answer is no. But it's a balance of risks. How do you balance uh, the risks that are to those who are at the moment locked down, uh, but at the same time, the other risks that come 
uh, from difficulties with not having children fall behind, children who are in homes of difficulty, who need to get back to school, poor kids that are falling behind with their education. And there's a WHO study that's looked at this, and the chief medical uh, or the chief scientific advisor of WHO, and I see, was on yesterday saying uh, that by and large, there is no real evidence of children passing on at the same rate or at a higher rate than adults to each other and to others. And I think this you were referring to this Australian yes. uh, report as well. So, so look, there's no absolute, there's no perfect answers in any of this. We all have to recognise every day we go to work, we live our lives, we balance the risks, you know, driving, crossing the road, getting onto trains. But this is an added set of risks and we have to figure out how to balance it by making sure we restrict through social distancing. The most important thing that WHO says, and I think this is really vital, hygiene is the single most important thing we do. Cleaning down shared surfaces, washing our hands, putting hand sanitizers on, you know, not touching each other. That's singly the most important thing, even more important than the social distancing part, because that's... But, but, what but the most important thing in a crisis like this <laughs> is that we can trust the government. And when Michael Gove says it's safe, then people need to be able to believe that the government is telling the truth to them. Yeah. Otherwise, the whole thing collapses. And, you know, this is the same yeah. Michael Gove yesterday who supported Matt Hancock, mm. who stated, the health secretary, that the government had put a protective shield around care homes, for example. Boris Johnson, the prime minister, said a few days ago that uh, he had you know, basically ordered care homes to be locked down before the rest of us. That was a complete lie. Reuters has done a major investigation showing there was absolutely no evidence mm. to suggest that care homes had received any official guidance to lock down before anybody else. In fact, they locked down after everybody else in mm. terms of not allowing people in. And on the question of care homes being protectively shielded, nothing could be further from the truth. There was a care home owner in the Sunday Times yesterday who mm. said this. Uh, he said... On March the 17th, Sir Simon Stevens, the NHS chief executive, said hospitals had to get 90,000 beds cleared, so they needed to get 30,000 people out. So they sent patients with no tests into care homes. They said, we don't need tests, you've just got to take them. Well, I've now got two homes with COVID-19. We can trace it. In both homes, it came from residents bringing the virus from hospital. So when the manager of another of my homes rang to tell me he'd refused, I said, categorically, well done. That home has 90 beds. To this day, it's still COVID-free. We know, indisputably, that the British government basically sent a load of elderly people with COVID-19, without testing they were negative, into care homes. And we now know as a direct consequence of that, which went on for weeks before an advisory on April the 15th from Matt Hancock, which mandated testing before they went back. We know that 22,000 excess deaths have now been suffered in our care homes. A staggering death toll, which is, I'm afraid, a scandal and a disgrace. And the idea that our government are now queuing up to say that there was a protective shield around care homes and that they were ordered into lockdown before everybody else, these are palpable, demonstrable lies. So when it comes to the education uh, part of this and whether kids should go back to school, I'm looking at the same ministers and I'm thinking, why can I trust you? OK, let's get this percent. I, I don't, I'm not in government, so I don't and wasn't privy to their information. Was a mistake? Were mistakes made at that time? Absolutely categorically, no question, yes. Uh, the medics accept that, the, the government accept, has to accept that, I believe it does accept. The government, the government it, doesn't it accept that, though, Ian. I mean, this is a right. well, thing. The government is not accepting finish? a mistake, is it? Yeah, OK, can I just finish the point that I'm making? Yes, there were mistakes, and yes, we've ended up with a significant problem in care homes, which w was avoidable. I would personally accept that. Having said that, though, every other country in Europe has faced almost exactly the same problem. Nobody out there made early decisions about care homes that should have been made. The average, I think, for death toll now in almost every country in Europe is somewhere around 50%. Yeah, but they're 50% of much in lower numbers in. The, the point well, not is, necessarily, not necessarily. You're well, actually, 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 with the exception of Italy, I, which hasn't reported not, for two or three weeks before us, Every yeah. other country's excess deaths are now there to be seen. Yeah, yeah, they are. But I, all I'm saying to you now is uh, I'm not using these as excuses, Piers. I'm trying to be straight and honest about this. I accept that mistakes clearly were made, and this was a judgment made on a broad range of people, shouldn't have been made. Hindsight's a great thing, but we shouldn't have done that. 
care homes have to be supported. I've worked, you know, as an MP to get uh, PPE to care homes with the local authority. We've held a stock of reserves. We've tried our level best to do it. That is the way to do it. But it is absolutely the case that the most vulnerable people, the very people we have to protect going through, uh, were exposed and should have been exposed. Having said that, on the schooling front, which is the question that we're asking really today, much more is known about this now. We've been in this for some period of time. Others have unlocked, and there have been studies now done of what's happening with school children after being unlocked and gone back to school. I think, generally, you ask me, is there no risk? There is nothing like no risk anywhere at the moment with COVID.